Perfect. Okay. Um, okay. I uh, Zoe and Simon's talks were so brilliant that now I feel mine will pale in the comparison. Um, so I'm doing less of a a story of um, principles and uh, virtues, uh, and more of a whistle stop tour through some of the aspects of publication ethics. Um, so let's go. Uh, so publication ethics is part of research integrity. Uh, it, it interfaces with research integrity, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, I've come from a background of working for uh, open access um, journal publishers. So kind of my view of publication ethics and research integrity has always been aligned, but it's really about best practice in communicating research. And that's um, from the, uh, the researchers, the reviewers, uh, the editors and the journal, every, everybody who interacts with an article, making sure that they're doing the, the right thing and not doing any of the wrong things. Uh, this is going to focus on journal articles. There's uh, similar issues will affect um, conference proceedings and book publishing, uh, but there will be differences. So if you have specific questions, then please raise those. There's many of the same principles apply to publication ethics as apply to research integrity. Uh, the overarching ones are going to be honesty um, uh, so being true uh, that, that true heart principle from Zoe I think is fantastic uh, transparency uh, showing as much as you can about what you're doing and also the process of what you're doing and then care so care about what you're doing making sure you're doing things well and then care about everybody involved in the process, so respecting the others involved in the process. Um, as uh, Zoe mentioned, the uh, Committee on Publication Ethics COPE, um, and the URL is there for the uh, website, is a major player in this area. I'm also on uh, COPE Council as well. That's one of my uh, conflicts of interest in this area. Um, why are we not seeing that? There we go. So there are tons of different areas of publication ethics, and I am going to try to go through authorship, dual submission, COIs, reporting guidelines, the ideas of ethics and consent, peer review, plagiarism, citations, copyright, and post-publication issues all in the next 20 minutes. So let's go. Um, we have a section on our UK Rio Code of Practice, which describes issues with publication and authorship. Um, so the URL is in the uh, middle of the screen there, um, and you'll be able to watch this video back and I think also have the slide shared. So you'll be able to um, download that to um, or look it up on the website and that's freely accessible online. OK, so authorship. Um, discuss it early and often. This is something that gets really tangled up. Um, it's one of the, um, even though it's not really directly associated with like the research um, content itself, it's one of the most vexed areas of publication ethics and research integrity as a whole. Authorship cases can drag on for years, even involve court cases. It's the kind of thing that you need, uh, can just break down relationships. Um, what authorship is about is about credit. This is why it's so important. It's the, uh, the, uh, it's the academic currency, but then it's also responsibility. It's taking, um, being accountable for the research. So if you're an author, you actually have to say, yes, I can stand by this work. There's various criteria. There's the um, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, otherwise known as the Vancouver Group. Um, there was a, a group um, that published in PNAS, there's the Council of Science Editors. The COPE noted in a discussion document on authorship, the two minimum requirements are as one, a substantial 
contribution to the work and two being um, accountable and giving approval for publication. So those are the two overarching things that apply. The ICMJE are more um, require you to have taken part in the conduct of the work, the kind of writing and editing and the approval and accountability, whereas Nuttertal and the um, uh, the CSE are uh, uh, more relaxed about it and they um, say that you can just do the substantial contribution to and or the research and the writing as well as the accountability and approval. Uh, so the criteria will vary but make sure at the start that your group understand what the criteria are that you follow in your institution and in the journals that you're going to be targeting to avoid confusion. There's a wider um, principle than authorship, which is contributorship. Uh, and this is quite a helpful idea. It's a little bit like how film credits work. Uh, so that you can see the role of everybody who's involved in the research and the reporting of the research broken down. So there's something that's really useful called the credit taxonomy, and that's now under the umbrella of NISO. Uh, they're the standards organization in the US. And so this gives, um, it's very much focused on, I think, um, uh, STEM areas, but it can be adapted wider. And it breaks down the different areas of, say, um, data collection. And so that then you can um, assign those roles in a structured way. And this structured way that helps you work out, OK, what were the contributions of everybody? And does that amount to authorship or not? Um, as well as authorship, then the thing that a lot of people forget about is acknowledgement. So these are the kind of step down from authorship. So anybody who was involved in the study but wasn't uh, an author should be in the acknowledgements and they can be credited um, in the structured way using the credit taxonomy. Um, and this is really important, but people should also, um, as well as people should agree to be authors, then they should also agree to be acknowledged as well. And a really useful tool to help structure authorship. So it's the ORCID identifiers. It's the Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. And this is a way that everybody can have a unique identifier that will mean that every time they log into a uh, publisher submission platform, they can say, yes, this is this is me and here are my previous publications so that there's a structured way and you can tell the difference between the different uh, John Smiths and the different Jing Wangs. Um, it's unfortunately not um, validated by most institutions, um, but it is still a really useful tool. So there's lots of problems that come with authorship. There's the idea of gift authors and ghost authors. These are flip sides of each other. So gift authors are people who don't deserve authorship, who are nevertheless given authorship, and ghost authors are people who do deserve authorship, but don't appear, even in the acknowledgements. Often the classic case is a maybe a medical writer from a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and they may do lots of writing and maybe adjust the statistics, but not get acknowledged. And this is the kind of thing that actually the pharmaceutical companies have really improved a lot in the past uh, 20 years. There were lots of um, scandals in the 1990s. Um, so essentially, the principle is that everybody who qualifies for authorship should be on the author list and nobody who doesn't qualify for authorship should be on the author list. But everybody who contributed should either be an author or be acknowledged with their permission. There is the problem of sale of authorship. This is something that um, first uh, came to attention about a decade ago and is that um, uh, sometimes entire articles are being sold, but often just um, different positions on an article are being sold as well. Um, and this will often happen at the point of uh, revision or at the point of acceptance. And so there's the entire there's brokers who do this. There's websites, marketplaces where authorship can be bought or sold. This is, I think, goes without saying, unethical. Um, there's more nuanced issues with equal contributions and corresponding authors. Authorship is the currency, but the most valuable currency are the first author, the last author, and 
the corresponding author. And so there are struggles over um, those positions, although, um, as I note, the author order is also a, is interpreted in different ways. And um, this means that the idea of equal contributions is used. I'm just seeing if, um, okay, yeah, and there was some discussion about whether my video was okay, but I think it is, I'll keep going. Um, so equal contributions is an indicator that people did the same amount of work, but then sometimes you get five authors all saying they did equal contributions. This starts to get um, a little bit silly. Um, Sometimes authors can be uncontactable. So either when you're writing up the work or after you've submitted, you can even have cases where authors may be deceased. So there are, there are complicated and sensitive topics about authorship. And all of this boils down to authorship disputes. As I said, these can be really nasty, um, drawn out and involve um, legal action. So the uh, prevention is much better than cure, but also, it's very difficult for authors, uh, for journals to resolve authorship disputes. Journals can um, get the authors, try to facilitate the authors talking to each other. But if the authors won't agree, then journals don't have many options because they don't know who really contributed. So they have to pass it to the institutions for an institution investigation. Um, this is one of the reasons it can be so drawn out. Often compromising on um, acknowledgements can be a way to... Um, uh, to, to get to a solution, um, but sometimes um, journals have to resort to expressions of concern. It shouldn't really be the kind of thing alone that you attract an art, retract an article for, but there can be other issues such as um, disputes about the content or permission issues that arise. So, uh, UK Rio, you can see this guidance is a little bit old and needs updating because it's got the old logo on, and that's something uh, I am working on. Um, but um, that guidance was written by um, uh, Liz Wager, who is uh, a former chair of COPE. And that guidance is really useful. Um, there's also a page of resources on our website that I put together recently, um, which gives um, a really deep dive into some of the literature, some of the key stuff and uh, recent discussion about it. So it's broken down into different um, topic areas. Um, so please have a look at that. Um, and we also ran um, something we called the Midsummer Challenge, um, which was in June. And uh, the URL is there and you can find that on our website as well. And so this is a way that you can look through some of the different questions and links and give yourself a bit of a refresher on authorship issues. OK, let's move on. Um, so dual submission and publication, redundant publication. So the principles are really easy. Um, but then there's complications. So don't submit the same work to more than one journal at the same time. So it can seem like something that would help um, speed up the process, but it contributes to um, waste of effort of the editors and the reviewers. It can lead to confusion and it can mean that also you don't respect the review process. You're essentially treating it as a game. That means you just want to get published as easy as you can. And you just pick the one that gives you the easy ride. And that's not really an honest approach. Um, it, you're, you need to respect your peers and um, take on board what they say rather than just ignoring them and going with um, the people who didn't spot the problems that the other reviewers raised. You shouldn't publish the same work more than once, but there's exceptions. Preprints are okay with most journals. So you can post a, um, an early version of an article on a preprint server or on an institutional repository. It's clear that it hasn't been peer reviewed, it's not the final version, and you're allowed to formally publish that. Also the same with theses, you can publish your thesis and then you can publish articles that stem from it without worrying about it being dual publication. 
conference proceedings are a trickier one. The general rule of thumb is maybe about 30% difference, but there's copyright problems wrapped up with this. So you need to check with um, the different publishers to make sure that you're not breaching a problem and just be transparent about it. That's one of the keys is everybody knows what's going on. Everybody's agreed to it and then you won't find yourself in problems. And there's also things like community guidelines, um, often things like um, prescribing guidelines in medicine or reporting guidelines in different fields. And those can be published in multiple journals with the agreement of those publishers and editors. And the ICMJE give a really great um, guidance on this. Conflicts of interest. The rule of thumb on this is quite simple. It's anything that might interfere with the objective design, conduct, analysis, or reporting of research, or with its peer review or editorial handling, or anything that could be reasonably perceived to interfere with it. So it's not always about whether it actually does affect the process, it's about whether it could and whether you declared it fully, and whether you've managed that conflict of interest. So often people focus on the financial side um, about money. So what grants and sponsorship you get, other payments as well. So it doesn't have to be a direct payment for that piece of work for it to be a uh, conflict of interest. If you're doing work on a drug that is manufactured and sold by a pharmaceutical company and you've received funding um, for another project from the same pharmaceutical company that is still a conflict of interest and still needs to be declared. But there's also a whole slew of non-financial conflicts of interest that people should be declaring as well. Things like affiliations, so that their employer or um, maybe boards that they sit on. This can even be for non-profits. Um, there can be things like uh, co-authorship and collaboration with other people family and friends. So often it's seen that your family, your immediate family's conflicts of interest are essentially your conflicts of interest. Um, also, personal beliefs can affect uh, uh, research and how it's reported. And if there's something that really um, uh, aligns very strongly or clashes very strongly with um, the area of research, then that should also be declared. So the, the principle is, if in doubt, declare it. If it's something that came out afterwards and would be embarrassing, then just make sure you're upfront about it. Declaring conflicts of interest is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. So another aspect of um, reporting that is sometimes overlooked is reporting guidelines. So this is um, this is kind of goes along with um, what Simon's saying about structured governance. This is structured reporting to make sure that you've um, really included every single item that's necessary. So this is really most advanced in clinical research. The Equator Network is fantastic for this. There's Consort for randomized controlled trials. There's Prisma for systematic reviews. And there's um, many more that have been um, reached approval, but there's hundreds of different ones. So um, have a look on that site. There's the idea of trial registration as well. So clinical trials have long been required to be pre-registered. So you post on um, a website. So that logo up in the top right is the WHO website that um, is the umbrella for all of these different trial registries. And so you say what you're going to do, how many participants, when you're going to do it, um, all of those different things before you start the trial so that you can't then um, go back and change everything. Everyone can see what you're planning to do and you've got to justify changes. There's also the Prospero database for systematic reviews. Outside clinical research, there's the Fair Sharing um, website, fairsharing.org, which gives a whole bunch of other standards, databases and reporting guidelines. They're not as well developed as in clinical research, but there are many in biology, especially, um, especially in genomics. And there's also the idea of registered reports. So that logo um, in the bottom right, um, the idea of being pre-registered is very similar to trial registration, but it can work in different ways so that you submit your article to a journal that accepts registered reports. And this is before you've done the research, before you've collected the data. So they look at why you're doing it and your methods and they review it. And then they say, okay, 
um, we think this is good. Come back to us when you've uh, collected the data and analyzed it, and then we will publish it no matter what the outcome is of the work. So this is a great way to um, guard against um, the bias against so-called negative results. Um, so ethics of consent, I won't go into this too much because Simon covered it, but if you're reporting on human research, if it's interventional, you really are going to have to um, have uh, considered very carefully your, um, your ethics and have formal ethical approval. If it's observational, it can vary. Um, it's much more of a gray area with social media, for example, but there are guidelines out there about this. Um, case reports as well, you don't necessarily need ethics approval, but you, um, are, or even like cons consent to participate in research, because it's not really research, but um, you, you may need consent to, uh, there's a typo there, consent to publication. So if somebody, lots of somebody's um, case details or their picture are included, even if you've like blanked out the, uh, the eyes, which isn't a recommended approach anymore, then you should get the consent of that person to publish. Um, so there's those different ideas of um, ethics approval and um, written informed consent to participate in work and then consent to publish anything that um, may reveal somebody's um, personal information. In animal research, obviously consent isn't an issue, but you also need um, um, ethics committees in place, um, depending on the animals that you're using. So make sure that you've got your ethics documentation because journals may ask for it and make sure you've got good ethics and consent statements. So even if you didn't need ethics approval, if you're working on anything related to humans and animals, then you should, um, even environmental research, for example, you should be including an ethics statement, even if you didn't need or obtained ethics approval. So in peer review, um, I think I found a lot of different people will uh, think that certain forms of peer review aren't ethical and all of these different forms of peer review are ethical. It's just that some people aren't as familiar with them. So people will um, have a strong uh, attachment to the one that they're familiar with from their uh, field. So you can do single or double anonymized. So single anonymized is where the reviewers can see who the author is, but not the other way around. Double anonymous means neither the authors nor the reviewers know who the other ones are. It's difficult to achieve, especially in the era of um, pre-printing, then double anonymization can be breached quite often. But there is some um, increasing evidence that it may reduce biases in review processes, although the, the evidence is mixed. Open peer review has different aspects. It can mean that the reviewers are named to the authors. It can mean that they're also named after publication to the public. And it can also mean that the reviews are published after, after publication alongside the article with or without the reviewer name. So there's all sorts of different ways to run peer review as long as you're running it clearly giving people um, the idea when they're um, agreeing to review what the format is then it's still going to be ethical. One of the um, real principle, principles that underlines peer review is confidentiality. So you should keep what you've done private unless you've got approval to share it. Um, there's also a really important principle, which is competence. So if you're doing peer review, then you have to make sure that you really know what you're doing in this area. You don't have to be expert in all aspects of the article, but you should um, decline to review if you're not um, adequately qualified in the area. Otherwise, you're really um, just wasting the time of the editors and, and the authors and possibly giving them false trust in the review process should be constructive as well. Nobody likes these um, vicious takedowns. I think they're getting less common, but they still exist. Open peer, peer review is a way to um, improve the constructiveness of reviews. There's been randomized trials and it shows they're more constructive and polite and longer. Um, and uh, the, the phrase there, reviewer two must be stopped, is this um, idea of reviewer two is always the one who um, gives you um, nasty comments and reviewer two must be stopped as a Facebook group, which I'm a member of, which is both irreverent and um, constructive as well. Um, 
And you should give credit in peer review. Um, if somebody in your lab has helped you do a peer review, then tell the editor about that. Um, maybe if you're passing, a PI is passing it on to a postdoc, then they should really say to the editor, hey, actually, you know, it's my postdoc has done this review and they should be the one with their name on it, even in your internal system. It's not me because I wasn't the one to do it. So there is ghost writing is a problem within peer review as well as in article review. Okay, plagiarism. This one's quite simple to understand as well. It's taking the ideas, work or wording of someone else without appropriate attribution. So somebody else, and you're not telling people that you've done it. There's no such thing as an acceptable amount of plagiarism. People often ask, oh, how much plagiarism am I allowed in my article? So you just don't plagiarize, that's the principle. Um, people get confused because they're thinking about things like authenticate and um, turn it in, which is the kind of um, academic equivalent as opposed to the research um, journal use of authenticate. Um, and they're thinking about percentage thresholds like 10 or 15%, but that's not the same thing as plagiarism. Plagiarism is taking other people's ideas, work or words without appropriate attribution. And that's just something you shouldn't be doing at all. So you can avoid it by putting any wording that you cut and paste from another source into quote marks in your notes. So you don't accidentally mix it up with your own wording. Always cite and quote when you use someone else's words. And if you're using somebody else's words, use their exact words, not a fudge of what they said. So you get their exact words verbatim and put it in quote marks. And you include the citation of where you got it from, and then you're never going to be plagiarizing. Don't closely paraphrase. This is where you get somebody else's words and you jumble them around a bit, change the word order, add some synonyms, and never, never use synonym generators. This is the kind of um, word salad, um, tortured phrases that you get. And in method sections, often clear attribution is enough. So if you say, oh, we followed the um, principles of um, Smith and Jones and um, put the citation and say, um, and, you know, um, uh, and the, the wording, um, um, you know, follows um, their approach. And it's often seen that that's acceptable. Publishers are not going to be chasing you down for um, reproducing um, fairly um, standard phrasing in a method section. The closely related idea to um, uh, plagiarism is text recycling. This is reusing your own words. So it's not plagiarism, but it's often a misnomer is self plagiarism. And it can be fine as long as you're not reproducing too much. You've clearly indicated it, you've cited it, you've attributed it. It's not the results or the conclusions, because that's where um, you run into problems of redundant publications, salami slicing, slicing the research sausage too finely. And also there's the problem of copyright as well. So you might um, be taking your own work, but you might have signed over the copyright to a publisher and not have permission to reproduce a lot of wording. As I said, methods is normally fine, but um, if you're going to be copying the whole introduction from um, work you don't have the copyright for, that's probably going to be a problem. With citation um, ethics, only cite work you've actually read. Make sure you do a thorough literature review so that you're citing and discussing the recent relevant work. So you don't have, you know, there's no excuse for not being aware of um, similar work to yours, especially work that maybe contradicts it. You've got to be aware of it and discuss it and um, reconcile your work. Equally, don't excessively self-cite. You're allowed to and should refer to your own previous work, but don't pile in lots of references. And at the bottom, we've got this example. There has been much work conducted in this field, 1 to 50. And if that's the author's own work, then you're, you're not, not doing something that's going to help readers. And it looks like you're just trying to help um, um, gain your own metrics. Don't cite simply to curry favour. So if you're submitting to a journal, don't just throw in a whole bunch of um, uh, throwaway citations to the journal or the editor. You can cite them if they're actually relevant, but don't do it just for the sake of it. And don't let reviewers or editors coerce you into citing their work or the work of the journal. So be really wary with a reviewer who says, oh, everything's fine, but please just include this paragraph that happens to cite 15 articles to the um, same, same authors. 
It's called coercive citation. With copyright and licensing, so it's a bit um, uh, on a side to ethics, but just get permission to use text or figures. Think about copyright transfer. You're allowed to self archive your work by lots of authors and um, lots of publishers. And that means that you can post the um, final version before it goes into production on your own website, maybe on an institutional repository. With the Creative Commons licenses that the off common way to do um, open access, there's issues of the non-commercial license that can prevent others using it for commercial processes, but purposes, but that can often include education as well. For example, in Germany, that's the interpretation. And the non-derivative licenses can prevent people translating your work. So although some of these licenses can seem like a good idea, they can actually introduce barriers to other people reusing your work. If in doubt, speak to your librarian. They often know loads about this, as well as about open science in general. So post-publication, letters to the editor um, are a common thing or commentaries. So make sure that you're responsive if those are submitted. There's also, now we're in the world of um, social media. So there's the site called PubPeer where people can anonymously or named put comments about people. It was designed as a uh, essentially a journal club, but now it's very much used for sleuths to point out things like image duplication. And there's also um, common blogs. So be responsive to it. Um, don't just brush it off because it's not in the peer reviewed literature, but take it seriously. You might have to correct your work, in which case um, be um, open about it. Go straight to the publisher. Um, Expressions of concern are where uh, a journal will post um, a note to note issues. That might be something that's interim or it could be the final um, uh, conclusion. And in um, sad cases, then you get retraction. If you find a fatal flaw in your work, then doing the right thing will be rewarded and celebrated. It won't harm your career. There's been research done on this. People who retract for um, uh, you know, reasons of honest error, their, their citations to their other work doesn't go down afterwards. So make sure that you um, yeah, do the right thing. And as soon as you spot problems, be really upfront and transparent about it. So there's more. I am not going to go through all of this, but this is just to give you an idea that this was, even though this was such a uh, dash through um, the issues with publication ethics, there's so much more out there that I just don't have time to go into. Um, so now we can do the Q&A and there's some um, uh, ways to um, stay in touch with UK Rio there up on the screen. Matt, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive and detailed introduction to fundamentals of publication ethics and authorship and all the issues that come with it. And Don't. the uh, mayhem that can result when people don't understand the rules and, of course, when the certain actors in the system try to deliberately flout them. UK Rio a while ago got on some mailing list that it was ironic that we were getting emails from people trying to recruit us uh, to organize uh, to companies that write fake papers for free or asking us if we wanted to buy fake papers. We never we put them straight in the spam filter and deleted them, but I always wanted to write back and say, Are you sure you're asking the right people about this? Okay, we've had a variety of questions come through. Uh, and okay, firstly, is they ask text recycling? Does that mean from your own other published work, or does it have another meeting, another meaning? Yeah, it's it's generally going to be from your own published work. It might be also from your um, from a thesis as well, um, which is often much less problematic because you'll usually retain the copyright for that. So if you retain the copyright to work, then um, uh, you, you're allowed to reuse it. Um, the best practice is to attribute where it came from. Um, so copyright and plagiarism are two things that um, are in the same sphere, but they're not kind of totally aligned. Um, yeah. Text recycling, yeah, it's, it's, it's taking what you've um, published before and reusing it. Sure. Okay. Uh, Philip asks, obviously only site work that you've read, but how detailed is reading? Is it okay to read, say, just the abstract introduction and conclusions? Do you need to <clears throat> understand all the details, for example, if it's peripheral to your own area of research, but inform important background, say your research, an example he gives, you're researching the social impacts of AI, but you don't understand all the maths from an AI research paper? 
Oh, sure. There's going to be um, great about it. Um, yeah, you're, you're not necessarily going to be able to critically appraise all of the work in the area. I guess, um, I mean, one way would be to write it to um, not to show that you are resting on what others have done and that you you aren't the expert in it. So um, don't write with um, undue confidence. Um, make it clear that you you are um you know um taking what others have have said and done um i mean it, clearly in some areas you are going to be able to do critical appraisal so if you, if you are able to then please go ahead because if we've seen published research is not all all correct so um yeah but i i don't think you're all required to like learn about machine learning in order to discuss ai Thank you. Uh, Jeremy asks, could you clarify the use of corresponding author attribution, please? Uh, joint corresponding authors seems to be sometimes be suggested between authors as an indication of contribution, i.e. instead of recording co-senior or co-first author, and it feels there seems to be some confusion about the role of corresponding author attribution. Yeah, um, so Corresponding author is really just the person who um, readers should be contacting if they've got questions about an article. So um, it's seen as this um, kind of really important role, but it's almost like an admin role. So it, it in reality, it's not, you know, it's just the you're the, the poor sap who people are going to be writing to to um, say, hey, can I have a copy of your paper or, um, you know, can I can I get your data set or this kind of thing? But um it's kind of seen as the person who is like the most important or, you know, as well as the kind of last author. Um, but it's really not. But, um, yeah, you get these kind of conceptions that that's that's what that role is. And so then you get many people, um, uh, uh, you know, you, so you get like this three corresponding authors on an article, which is really unnecessary. Yes, it's interesting how in some fields or perhaps it, it, it different teams within the same field corresponding authors either seen as hooray i'm the person to whom people come to to ask questions about our research or it's oh great i'm the person to whom people are going to come to ask questions about the research it really seems to vary yeah so as well as the credit taxonomy then what you can do is just write a narrative um author contribution statement that actually describes what everybody did and then there won't be all of this just jostling for positions because anyone who wants to know okay who did the stats on this paper because that's the person i really want to talk to well they can just go to that it's really helpful for journal editors as well because if you want to know who did the um statistics and the methods because that's the, the thing that you're looking for then you don't have to you know hunt hunt around for which person has that expertise it's just written there in black and white yeah. also very handy if questions come up about the research policy later because you know who to go to and who did what from the outset yeah. <laughs> a question from simon in the chat can you describe the difference between gold and green open access and do all yeah. journals offer green as many seem to hide the option <laughs> um so these are terms that were coined by Stephen harnad in the early 2000s and Gold refers to publications that are published under an open license. So like the Creative Commons licenses or in the public domain. And so you can access that work immediately and without any permission barriers. So all you need is um, access to the internet and um, you, you can read it, read it and reuse it for free. That's what gold means. It sometimes gets confused because um, the idea of gold um, also has a connotation of money. Um, so people think it refers to article processing charges, um, but it doesn't. So um, gold OA can include um, uh, articles that have um, no funding or have consortium funding, all sorts of different funding models. It's not about that. It's about um, uh, the license that's used. Green is a way to get articles read for free in that are published in traditional journals behind a subscription barrier. So it is a way that authors can post the, um, the uh, final author version, but without the publisher formatting and maybe the copy editing. And so they're allowed by many publishers to do this and they can post it on their own website. They can post it um, in an institutional repository or some cases in a, um, uh, a subject repository such as PubMed Central. Um, 
uh, it won't have the same open licensing, and it doesn't have the same reuse permissions, but it means things can be read for free. And sometimes there's also a uh, delay, maybe six months until it can be deposited um, there. Um, the US um, uh, OSTP has recently said, right, everything that's federally funded by 2025 or 2026 has to be prop properly available immediately. And that's going to be um, quite a, um, a game changer, as well as the, um, the Plan S in, um, in mainly in Europe as well have really shifted things. Um, yeah, and do publishers hide this? I mean, some, some of them do, because obviously, if you're able to read it online for free, then why would you subscribe? I think lots of publishers are having transitional agreements and really are moving into the world of open access. So this is less of an issue anymore. And very um, 20 years ago, publishers were really um, hotly contesting open access. And really now it's something that's been adopted. Um, so um, there's a, um, I think it's the uh, Nottingham, it's called Sherpa Romeo, and that's a, uh, a directory of um, policies on uh, green open access. So that's really useful. Matt, thank you very much. That was really helpful, a very comprehensive answer.